Okay. So our first speaker is uh, Wilfreda from the Government of Canada. Hello, hi everyone. I will go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully this works. Is that visible to everyone? Great. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Peck, so much. As he mentioned, my name is Wilfrida Edward Dalsey. I lead on the open data policy portfolio for the open government team at the government of uh, Canada's Treasury Board Secretariat. My role is really to help bridge the gap between the data that's held by our departments and the data that the public is asking for. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here, especially among such great speakers. So my approach today will just be to talk more broadly about the steps we're taking to mature open data across the federal public service. So to do that, I'll touch on where we are in our journey, how we intend to mature it, and then some upcoming next steps that you can expect to see in the year ahead. So uh, let's make this presentation larger. There we go. So first, where we are in our journey, many of us here are pretty familiar with the GovLab's interpretation of the history of open data and how it's framed as distinct waves that are characterized by certain best practices. So for Canada, prior to 2011, like many countries, we were in the first wave and focused on uh, freedom of information through our Access to Information Act. For the last 10 years though, we've been there's been a major push for open by default in the second wave through our five national action plans to the Open Government Partnership, as well as other successes along this timeline that demonstrates our progress. Thanks to these and other efforts, in just over a decade, we've been able to successfully publish over 35,000 data sets under an Open Government license on the Open Government Portal with over 5 million downloads since it was launched in 2013. So Canada's really solidified our international position by ranking among the top five countries globally in open data. And so with that, the natural progression of this work is to evolve into the next wave to publish with a purpose. Now, beyond just doing this as a best practice, there are very specific reasons why it's time to focus on our maturity when we evaluate the outcomes of publishing based on what's readily available, these and other strengths have been balanced by the challenges that you see on this slide. I won't go into them in detail because everyone here can read and our time is pressed, but essentially um, the challenges are emphasizing open by default and um, we haven't been quite able to address them through that approach. So, the internal to government trap challenges have translated to slow open data uptake and reuse of open data by the public, because although there's large quantities of data available again through the portal, what we're hearing from users is that the relevance of that data could be greater to help meet their research or innovation needs. So with that, how do we intend to mature open data in Canada? There are a series of policies, programs, and projects that are being prioritized over the next year that will contribute to that maturity and help us go towards a more demand-driven approach. So I'll just go through each of these um, quickly. First, starting with the policy, each of the, the items that, that are listed here are under review or have been reviewed to evolve in a way that enables publishing with a purpose. And looking at the directive on open government, we're moving from prioritizing data based on its value to our internal business objectives to prioritizing it based on its potential value to the public. We're also working to develop Canada's first national strategy on open government, which will take us from having departments with individual open government initiatives to having high level strategic direction for all federal public servants as it relates to both open government broadly and specifically to open data. Then with the Access to Information Act, this has really been a key pillar of democracy in Canada and has been since 1983. So the act guarantees the right of Canadian citizens to request information that's under control by the government institutions. While the request-based process under the act remains unchanged, the act was amended in 2019 to also include a new section that requires the proactive publication of certain information that's of interest to Canadians. 
So this change is part of the broader shift in focus from releasing information in response to requests to releasing more information proactively. Next, the data strategy for the Federal Public Service is being renewed since it was first released in 2018. Again, to move away from data for individual departments to improving community outcomes from an enterprise perspective. And then the final area that falls under our policy instruments is the Government of Canada's digital ambition, which is it's an uh, enterprise plan that guides the delivery of digital services across federal departments. And that too is evolving from focusing on the technology that we need to more what users are asking for and becoming more user-centric. So although all of these have slight nuances that distinguish them, overall the common thread, again, is the shift from an internal focus on what we need to do our jobs well to an external focus on users and the public, which is what essentially underpins publishing with a purpose. Next, in terms of the programs that we're looking at, the, we'll start with the National Action Plan um, on Open Government. So the current plan spans from 2022 to 2024. It's the fifth of its kind, and it was launched just this past fall. And it's the first time that we have a dedicated commitment to open data for results. So under that commitment, we're, we're consigned to building and supporting an ecosystem, an open data ecosystem across Canada. And we'll be doing that through measured um, initiatives, some of which include establishing an open data advisory working group made up of internal and external st stakeholders that will help prioritize the data and information that we release. We'll also be developing a national open data plan and that will have in it open data maturity models as well as self-assessment tools that can help departments gauge where they are in their maturity, as well as give them the steps that they need to take to get to the next phase of their maturity. The second program we'll look at this year is called Request a Dataset. There's currently um, a feature on the portal that allows any member of the public to go on the website and suggest a data set or a piece of information that you think should be made available freely and openly under an open license. We'll be reviewing that functionality and expanding it into a comprehensive program with the elements that are listed here, and then leverage that to publish data based on public demand. And then lastly, the ecosystem engagement piece is always ongoing for us. We're always in touch with our Canadian partners like Go Open Data and the Canadian Open Data Society that are here today, as well as our international partners like the ODC. And then finally, there are specific projects that we'll be undertaking. Um, our web content optimization is really meant to enrich the end user experience and ensure that high value data is more discoverable and more usable. We'll also be modernizing the way we receive and manage feedback on the portal. Um, and then we'll be providing resources, guidance um, to users through documentation like the Open Government Data Guidebook, as well as a user guide for our Open Government Registry and updating the guideline on service and digital. And then of course, improvements to the portal itself to improve access, relevance, availability by expanding its functionality to include data validation, to ensure that we're having the best data quality, we're including visualizations, and um, we're providing better analytics capabilities. So with all of that on deck, what are the immediate next steps? In the upcoming fiscal year, which for us starts uh, April 1st, uh, we'll be rolling out a lot of these initiatives. So given the time, I won't go into detail on, on each of these, but the intention is that many of them will be iterative and ongoing. And so they will be rolled out throughout the year. So definitely keep an eye out on your social media for those. And then the last thing I wanted to mention that is that although several groups across our department are implicated in all of the initiatives that I mentioned, we're unified in our understanding that the end state is still to be open by default. So that second wave, but we've matured and learned some things along the way. And we now recognize the publishing with a purpose and open by design are going to be the things that ultimately get us there. So with that, thank you all for your time. Um, I've included some extra contextual information and links in the annex of this presentation, which I assume will be shared, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions if we have some time. Thank you, Wilfrida. 
Uh, does anybody have any questions? Anybody uh, in the uh, amongst our speakers? We have one minute. Any questions? Well, uh, I, I, I can jump in. <laughs> I please. have some questions. Well, I feel that in Montreal, it, it, we are really at the same point, well, as ca Canada government. But when you mentioned uh, opening by purpose, this is a challenge that we are facing too. How do we know what's the purpose <laughs> of the for citizens? And this is where we are really looking to have good solution to to go and take take this information uh, to for citizen purpose as uh, our um, open data license doesn't allow us to know who is using the data. So people are taking the data and few of them ask questions, but how do you do uh, from your side to know what people want? What is the purpose for them? Yeah. It's a great question and it's a challenge that's sort of across the ecosystem for sure. In our case, we can make a lot of assumptions about what people want, but the best way to find out is to ask them. And so we have feedback loops built into the portal through comment functionality. So if somebody sees a data set and they see an issue with that data set, they can make a comment on it to suggest to us how that data set can be improved. We also have the suggested data set, which is evolving to the requested data set program, which will allow people to give suggestions on the data gaps on the portal. So where data is not available, they can tell us where, where we can improve that. And then other jurisdictions I know have done things like putting a survey on their portal, not something that's labor intensive or demands a lot of, of the user, but just a quick list of questions that can give them an idea of where their gaps are, who is asking for the information, um, and what the needs are to be met. Just a few things that we've done that, that we found to be successful. And then the last thing is actually also through our partnerships. So with CODS and with working with people like Go Open Data, they have a perspective and a connection to the community that we may not necessarily have. So we're able to tap into their networks to find out more about uh, what the needs are and where the gaps are. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have more time for questions. Uh, next up is Yuri Fonga from uh, Go Open Data. Yuri is a, a veteran of uh, open data in Canada. Okay, thanks very much, Peck. Uh, can everybody see my shared screen? Yes, okay, great, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm pleased to be presenting on behalf of, of uh, Go Open Data Association, or GOOD, uh, and we hope that this high level kind of view of our organization will, will be of interest uh, to the uh, participants today and possibly start some new collaborations because we're big, we're big into being collaborative. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, before I get going, echo uh, Cyrus's comments um, in the chat and give kudos to ODC for hosting this great idea of open open house. And I'm actually thinking that I will uh, copy that idea and use it uh, uh, use it as a good open house during uh, during open government week uh, in in May. So again, thanks for that. So I'll move on to uh, just explaining a little bit about our, our organization. Our beginnings were back in 2013 as a single day event. Uh, it wasn't envisaged as anything other than that. Uh, and I was part of the, uh, the planning uh, group, but we actually decided uh, collectively to continue it as annual conferences and that had worked really well. And at one point, uh, high level of interest, we had uh, over 350 people at one of those conferences. And we incorporated as a federal nonprofit in 2019. And so we started with expanding beyond just uh, an annual conference. 
and looked at uh, paid memberships, association websites, uh, monthly events together with projects, advocacy and collaboration. Collaboration being a big part of it. So here's uh, kind of a um, an idea of the level of collaboration that we that we do. So with ODC, uh, we collaborate, and, and Natty is quite often a a speaker, and she will be a speaker at our uh, annual conference in May. Um, but we're also an endorsing institution for the Open Data Charter principles. Uh, also collaborating with. Uh, uh, NYU, the governance lab, and uh, as mentioned by Wilfrida, the Canadian Open Data Society, uh, we are continually collaborating with them on a number of different projects and initiatives uh, to spur open data and open government beyond where it currently is. Code for Canada, uh, the open government partnership, the uh, local uh, Open North that uh, both Beck and I were uh, members of uh, some years ago, uh, one of the leading uh, kind of, uh, open organizations in Canada. Uh, Data for Good, who have a number of chapters across the country. Um, and uh, then also you know, with the governments, uh, the Ontario Digital Service, um, and at the Canadian end of it, uh, the Canadian Open Government Office. And I should, I should note that I am, uh, I am just coming into the the role of uh, uh, civil society co-chair for uh, Canada's uh, Open Government Multi-Stakeholder uh, Forum. Uh, we also deal with uh, many municipalities and uh, MISA is the Municipal Information Systems Association, uh, Ontario, uh, and Be Spatial, which used to be ERISA Ontario, is focused on uh, GIS and, and we know through working with open data that GIS data is kind of a mainstay and, and top priority when it when it comes to releasing open data. So um, our services run a gamut, I'm just very high level. First of all, knowledge sharing events and also co-designing projects. We uh, we know that uh, you know when you do crowdsourcing, the more people you get, the better ideas end up uh, coming and the better design of whatever program get into one just a little bit later that you get. And we have newsletters. We have our own channel called GoodTube on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, and then there's a, a host of uh, specific information that's only available to our members. So I mentioned knowledge sharing as being a big part of who we are and what we do in our signature event is still the annual conference. So good 23, we have the theme of bridging the open divide. And this may be, uh, you know, of, of interest to a lot of people because basically what we're saying is, yeah, we're talking the talk, but we're not necessarily walking the talk um, that, you know, talking about policies and adhering to principles is is easy to speak to, but not necessarily uh, easy to actually execute on. So with, uh, on May the 4th, we have a number of workshops, one and a half hour workshops. Uh, the Open Government Partnership uh, Local is one. Um, the ABCs of artificial intelligence, can't go anywhere these days about uh, talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, we have uh, GovLab uh, speaking to implementing the revised periodic table for open data and looking at emerging technology to integrate natural and built infrastructures. On the, on the conference day, the fifth, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Uh, we have a keynote panels, uh, keynote speakers panel, uh, open data equity panel, growing open panel, uh, lightning talks. Uh, and I'd encourage anybody that has an interest to submit uh, their proposal for a lightning talk. Uh, diversity of open panel uh, and closing panel, which is looking at open open futures. So there's a lot of diverse content in this year's uh, conference. So we're we're hoping, and it's being done as a hybrid event, both uh, virtually as well as being uh, uh, in person in Toronto. So current activities, uh, actually coming up on Tuesday, we have uh, Brewing Open Data, the standards approach. Uh, and I had already mentioned our annual conference, Bridging the Open Divide. Um, and I think we'll have, the following week will be Open Government Week and we'll have uh, that open house I had suggested earlier. <clears throat> Our projects, and these are being done in collaboration with, with CODS, the professional open data certification. We had researched and we had not found anywhere uh, that there, there was open data certification for those people specializing in that area or segments of that area. So we're currently in the development phase uh, you know, for that certification program. And also as part of that, from a content point of view, we will be doing a refresh of the do-it-yourself open data toolkit that was originally created for uh, the government of Canada through, uh, through Open North. So our connections, you can get a hold of us at uh, go-opendata.ca or go through uh, goodtube.ca to see the uh, uh, or connect uh, by by email um, either connect at go-opendata.ca or myself Yuri Conga at outlook.com so with that uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that people might have thank you very much uh, we have time for one question anybody from the audience or from our speakers I have a question if nobody has a question. Okay, uh, Yuri, I, I, I think this is also a, a great place to have reflection <laughs> on, on advocacy on open data over the past years. And uh, I, I'm curious to know uh, how has the, uh, the challenge of creating and sustaining a, uh, go open data may be changed throughout the years. How, how is it different now compared to back when you started? Yeah, I think uh, back when back when we started, uh, it was you know the cool thing to do. Okay, <laughs> open data, cool. Uh, let's do that. And you had some people or some organizations. And I'm thinking primarily at the municipal sector. It was a bit of a PR, uh, you know, public relations approach that this is uh, something that will put us in the good books. Uh, it'll be good for public relations, and uh, and yeah, okay. So we think we think it'll be good for the citizens, but we're in businesses, but we're not 100% sure. Uh, I think with the later people that came into um, open data at the government levels is that it was a little more precise in uh, in coming up with the business case. Why would we do this? Uh, and I think that unfortunately, here's the interesting thing. It goes back to a survey that we did with the uh, public sector folks last year. Uh, and we asked about, you know, how much resources were being made available for for open data and open government. And unfortunately, 60% um, said they were still doing most of it off the side of their desk. And that's the wrong thing. I think, I think we have a resourcing issue within the public sector. 
uh, you know, to move this beyond where it currently is. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Yuri. Okay, so next up, we were going over to the other side of the border. Uh, Mark from uh, City of Seattle. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I think my, my presentation remarks, I think will support what some of my colleagues have said. So I thank you, Wilfried and Yuri for your comments. Um, I'll just give you a brief little profile of what the city of Seattle looks like. Um, our open data program was launched in 2010. It was given a significant boost by an executive order and formal open data policy in 2016. However, that policy is and remains an open by preference policy. So we really would like you to play along, but we give you permission not to play along. And you can see some of the concerns that that would create. Um, it, we lost resources and support a few years after that and have begun a concerted effort to relaunch our open data program, kind of what we're calling open data 2.0 in, in uh, 2021. We're comparatively a small program. Uh, we have a it's a few hundred data sets, but those data sets are accessed more than 2 million times a month, largely by APIs. We have a lot of partners that um, pull a lot of sensor data, um, current event data from our open data portal. So we see, you know, maybe 90, 95% of the access of our data sets are done by machines. Uh, about 14% of our data sets are automated back to the source systems. We've made a real push to for automation, both to reduce the manual effort and especially to improve the quality of our data, the timeliness of the data that we deliver. Uh, and I can talk a little bit more about uh, some examples, but um, you know, moving from the SQL data space to the Oracle data space, to even being able to pull Excel flat files um, through pr appropriate permissions, pull that directly from source systems so that we can keep our data fresh and improve the accuracy and, and ultimately, hopefully, uh, provide more current and interesting information to the public that relies upon it. So where, what's next for our program? We're, we're kind of at the point uh, hinted at of reinventing ourselves and with, you know, with a strong push to make more high quality data available to the departments and to the public. Um, we have a well-established program, but limited participation. We, uh, again, our efforts kind of stall due to staff turnovers and past budget cuts. Um, internally, our data is still largely siloed. The departments don't necessarily share data internally. And what we're working hard to do is get sponsorship in place to elevate the program through policy, really pushing for open by default. Um, but then through the collaborations that we already have through the open data program, hoping to expand that more broadly into a data governance initiative across the city where we can enable appropriate internal data sharing and not just external. So we're, we're still struggling on the earlier end of that curve, I think, to demonstrate the full business value of data to each other. Um, you know, there is a little window in the public value of that, um, but, but you know, we, we, we still, departments still lack the data to improve their service delivery. We're not very good with equity outcomes yet. Our residents still feel overly surveyed when individual departments all are reaching out to them because we aren't, we aren't exposing it. So our, our approach, we're gonna continue to kind of leverage the internal support that we've built for open data over the last decade. We are going to kind of up uh, the engagement of our data and analytics community internally to really lead a data literacy effort across the city um, to help us lead that culture change to leverage their excitement to move us forward. Um, we have existing partnerships with some of the academic community. University of Washington has been a fantastic partner to us in the past. Uh, we work with their information school. They use our data sets to do capstone projects, but more importantly, we're trying to move into thoughtful research partnerships where we can get back into civic innovation projects where open data you know, is used by university researchers to solve real civic problems and demonstrate real value to the public, trying to get more in, into strategic partnerships. Um, we're working hard to rethink metrics and, and to measure how value is delivered through through open data, You know, not purely just the number of data sets. Uh, we, we were dealing with some uh, technology, uh, some uh, technology debt issues, some really old technology that, and, 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 and 
through a process of, of upgrading some of our technology, we were able to audit a lot of things and figure, find out that maybe fully half of our stuff, uh, half of our data sets had never really been used. We're pro providing no value. And so we're trying to restructure our approach in, you know, to be, to, to lead with, lead with the things that provide value so that, um, you know, so again, that we're not just uh, filling our portal full of stuff, but that we are actively, uh, you know, trying to engage with the right stuff. Um, again, no secret, we've had reduced staff and budget over the last public couple of years. Our departments really lack the capacity. And so we're trying to find pragmatic ways to do, to do more with less, to, to build on the energy of the community uh, that's already the data and analytics community and the academic community um, to, to lead with education to continue to generate interest while also working working to build that executive support. Um, we are a strong mayor led city. Um, we have the city of Seattle has 45 different departments and offices, you know, that often operate independently. As a result, data governance is gonna have to be somewhat of a collaborative effort. I don't, we don't have a chief data officer or a single unifying force tying us together. And so we, you know, our data's governance effort is really gonna be collaborative at the top level and at the bottom level to advance us forward and, and help, uh, help us build that business case. Uh, to invest more deeply. So a um, couple, just one last really thing is is really, we, we are seeing increased demand for like near real-time data. Our most popular data set is, is a 911, uh, is a real-time 911 call data set. It's actually updated every five minutes, but um, active fire department calls. Our, our second most popular data set is road weather sensor data. It's data that's aggregated every minute and published every hour uh, that, you know, just provides information about ice on bridges or railroad crossings that are opening. Um, they're very, very popular because uh, they feed directly into some of the partnerships with ride sharing companies and, you know, and pe people that are trying to navigate practical problems of how do I get through Seattle efficiently and, and feeding all of this real time road information to your Ubers and your lifts and other government agencies that are updating uh, traffic maps, etc. To, uh, to better inform the public as they try to navigate their way through the city. So uh, quick snapshot, happy to take a question or two. I think I've probably used up most of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Uh, anybody from the audience or from our speakers? I can jump in. Thanks. Uh, oh, go ahead, Hi. Wilfrida. Hi, Eugene. <laughs> um, not a question, but more of a comment. So much of what you said, uh, Mark resonated with our own experience um, at the federal level. So I, I would love to talk offline more yeah. about what the city of Seattle has experienced. I, I would say though that don't underestimate the ability of public value to help build the business case, right? Keeping the user at the center of everything that you're doing helps build that value proposition to your internal um, senior management team. So just wanted to leave you with that. Hopefully Thank you for that. Connect. Thank you for that. I'll briefly say, sorry, um, Mark, you know, you might as well do my presentation because everything you said <laughs> applies to our city as, as well. Yeah. I'm going to give some examples of maybe where we had some successes, um, but just so you know, you're not alone. And literally everything you said, I was like, check, check, check. Oh, yeah, that sounds like us. Check, check. So um, maybe there's some, uh, um, you know, condolence and sympathies around the struggle we yeah. all have. They're fairly similar, but I think uh, you're not alone. So uh, kudos for you guys for the work that you're doing and, and continuing to struggle through some of those challenges that I think we all face. Thank you. Thank you. Eugene, please go ahead. Uh, that was great. Thanks for that. I, I think I've heard many, many stories across different governments and like you highlighted earlier, this, the challenges of open data in this day and age. Uh, my question actually was, I was really curious, the 911 data set that's being kind of uh, accessed so frequently, do you happen to know of some of the outputs that are beneficial to society, like to your citizens? I'm curious because I've often heard of data sets used Usually, the GTFS is the, the example that's uh, that I know of that that is more machine like that is access mm -hmm. through maybe APIs. But I'm curious about that 911 uh, data set. So I love the question, and I should have a better answer. I, I know that there are you know public safety buffs in the media that kind of keep tabs on what's happening around the city by way of that. Um, 
I don't know if it has a more profound purpose. It must somewhere, but I don't know what it is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have time very quickly, Yuri, if it's very quick. Yeah, uh, I was just, you know, <laughs> listening to you, uh, Mark. I, I empathized with you because I've heard it so often from all levels of government undertaking open government and open data. So I was curious as to whether there were, uh, because these are common problems, whether in the US there's a concerted effort to kind of collaborate and address the issues uh, that you stated. So I think there is through like Bloomberg What Works City that is in some of their data certification effort that elevates the value of performance data as well as open data and provides practical training, you know, to just kind of give people a head start in uh, the beginnings of data governance and data inventories and data quality and multiple different steps along the way towards building a more robust data infrastructure. Um, there's an organization called Metro Lab Network. Seattle is one of the founding members of that that intentionally matches uh, academic communities together with municipal governments. Uh, and, you know, to do again, kind of civic innovation projects. So I'm, I'm aware of a couple efforts that we're engaged in. And I think, you know, most of those forums offer opportunities for different municipalities, state, local, but a lot of at the municipal level, we've participated um, to have some of those conversations. And I see my peers all across the spectrum, people that are, you know, very early and trying to publish their first couple of data sets, people that are much further along, a city like New York that's been open by default for a bunch of years and has thousands of data, you know, things that we aspire to, right? Um, but all, all kind of across the spectrum. And, and Yuri, I think your earlier comment about how, you know, some of the earlier adopters were kind of attracted by the uh, the the luster of it, right? A kind of shiny object of, of open data and, and the hope for good. And, um, and those that have that have followed behind us have learned some of the lessons like leading with with legislation, you know, as opposed to executive orders that can be overturned by subsequent administrations or or at least not prioritized by subsequent administrations, which has been the pattern that we followed. And and so now we're again, we were kind of an early adopter and really kind of trying to uh, catch up uh, and, and kind of get back up to to, to the kind of with some of our other peers that are a little bit further along. So there, there are discussion forums. I don't know that, you know, and again, like the Bloomberg is actually, they offer a certification, a gold level, a silver, silver level certification for municipalities that, that uh, make significant strides towards uh, a more mature data stance generally, because they, you know, again, really favor the actual, the performance metrics, the what are you doing with the data, but but also offer pragmatic tips for helping people get, you know, get that data available in the first place. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for, for the presentation, uh, for the discussion. Um, next up, we are coming back to Canada and we will be moving to the city of Montreal. Hello, everyone. I feel that it will say the same as the city of Seattle, in fact, and probably as the same as the city of Hamilton. Well, I will share a presentation probably with too much slides, so I will try to go fast so we move forward. Anyway, I will repeat some of the keywords that you said, data governance. And, um, here we go. So I guess that you see my screen and uh, my presentation, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Good. Uh, we see the we see your whole browser screen, so yes. You can, uh, yes. I just there start. we go. So um, I'm Veronique Dufour from the city of Montreal. I work uh, as the open data and data strategy team leader. Uh, since six years, so I was not there at the beginning of the of the open data move, movement for the city of Montreal. Uh, today, I thought that I was will going to share um, our success, the key success that we have, the thing that we are challenging with, and we are what's our next step. So that's why probably it's a bit similar. 
maybe a few words about Montreal. We are the, the biggest city uh, in the province of Quebec, the French province of Canada. Uh, in fact, the city of Montreal is an island. Um, well, Montreal is an island, and on this island, there's 15 cities. The city of Montreal is one of them, and the city of Montreal is a constitute of 19 boroughs. 19 boroughs which have mayors and elected people, so we have competency uh, for the municipal administration at the borough level, at the level of the city, and at the level of the island. So I mentioned this because it's really complex. And uh, for the data, it's a huge challenge because we have all those, those pieces of data to go and to take from all of this, those stakeholders. So for 2 million citizens. Uh, in Montreal, we have many things around, uh, around AT, you know, we pioneer in deep learning. We have a lot of headquarters in IT, uh, many university research centers. Uh, this means that there's people there that need to have more with smart city and want to, want to have data. And this is probably why we uh, start in 2010, the open data program. Why at the beginning we start the, the open data program? Well, probably like all of you, we start because it was important for transparency. But soon we realized that it was really something important for our own orga organizational efficiency. In fact, uh, many of the people that use the open data portal are our own a civil servant at the city of Montreal because it's a complex city. It's the easiest way to go and to find our data also at all the level of collaboration that we have, uh, it's useful. And we hope um, and we believe that it's, uh, it's, it's something good for economic development. You know, as a city, we are not always uh, agile to do a good citizen services. So when we see great tools uh, coming from the, the, the company here, well, like Transit or other one, well, we, we think that we, uh, it's successful for us. And at the end, well, with all those services uh, coming from data, but well, I believe that its citizen engagement is better. Um, the success of Montreal may be some keys of success that I think that we uh, we had over the years. Well, since 2015, uh, open data is the central pillar of the strategic orientation. At first for the smart city, now even in the priorities of the organization, we have an open data policy and a data governance directive since 2015 something that helped push with our, our colleague. We, uh, as soon as we launched the open data policy, we start a, a, a data inventory. It's public, but also we are the owner of the public inventory for the city. So everybody who's looking for uh, data come to us, a small teams of, uh, of five people, in fact. And this is one of the other key of success a success I think we have, we have a dedicated team, open data team of a passionate person. You know, sometimes uh, we hear about uh, the impression of the civil servant uh, in the population, but really people in the, the open data, data team are passionate. They come from different expertise. I'm a geomatic engineer, GIS engineer. We have people from mobility, really real user that were in citizen before that came with us to put the movement forward. So uh, we also uh, have an internal data ambassador network. So people everywhere, like we are like an octopus with people everywhere, a network that we build to have the information uh, on the different subject that the, the city work on. 
uh, it's a, a huge playground, you know, we, we deal with data from finance department and uh, a sustainable department, mobility department. So we have people everywhere in our network. Uh, also, we uh, built over the years uh, an automation process so that we are able to take the data from the system to have more accurate data. Um, of course, our website is one of the, the thing that we made that is good and we put more and more visualization on it because data is good, but as we realize that raw data is hard to uh, to understand for most of the, the citizens, so we try to talk with data more and more. Um, we also uh, have a great visibility for our data. We have our own portal. Then uh, the metadata is pushed on uh, the, the provincial portal. And it's also pushed on the, the Canada, Canadian portal. So people that are looking for the data of Montreal, it's easy to find it. Or not, if you go on the Canada website, there's so many data, but we, they, we, you can find the data of Montreal almost everywhere. Uh, our open data policy uh, that was launched in 2015 have this guiding principle of open by default. This is something really useful that we continue to push in inside the city to be able to uh, to publish with our colleagues that have many priorities. So. This is something that I, one of the key success that we have is probably this guiding principle. Um, but um, even if we have many success, I feel that uh, there's many to improve also. You know, we, we are facing some challenge, the same as you probably. Um, over the years, we have some reflection on how to switch the open data work to open to data management work. In fact, uh, here's my finding over time. We we need well, well I as an as I mentioned before, we don't really know who are our user. Of course, we have some discussion on our website, but really uh, our best journey is when we saw on the on the journal. One of our data set published with the key information, but we don't, we not own, it's not all, always easy to see what people are doing with our data, and it could be useful to push more data. Also, uh, I think that to do open data, we really need a strong data governance, and that this at the city of Montreal. It's the opposite. In fact, it's, it's because of the open data movement that we realized that we were not that strong in governance. So at first we were the open data team and now we are leading the two project, the data governance project and the open data because one uh, answer to the other. Uh, and this is why we moved from publish by default to publish by purpose. Of course, of course, we, we want to keep open by default, but our first open data policy mentioned that everything was going to be published by the end of 2018. Five years later, only 30% of our data are published because it's hard. Um, there's a lot of new data set. We have to follow everything to be uh, to be sure that it, it, it's good. So now we are looking at the data. The, the next data that we will publish need to be um, good and useful for citizens. So and this is a challenge because we have to know people more. Uh, I mentioned that uh, broad data is maybe not the the good orientation now, we still publish raw data, but we know that we have a lot of work to do to, to make talk the data, you know. I, I think that the, the data va value is not on the raw data. You, when 
people mentioned that data is gold. I think that it's the analyze of data that is gold. So we have we have a lot of work to do there. And um, we have to do data literacy also to help citizens to, to understand our data. And I think that uh, one of the finding also we have is the importing the importance of being inside the pri priority of uh, of the city. And that's why uh, two years ago, Montreal launched its first strategic plan and we were really happy to put the word open data uh, inside it. Like th this helped us to put open data each time that people have to work on their pr priority. There's this small <laughs> open data needs that is beside it. So this is helpful full for us. Our next steps, um, well, we work on open data. Of course, we want to improve. We still continue to improve the process of publishing, publishing data that are fresh, that are uh, updated. Um, but we work more and more on community engagement. How do we, how can we be more present in the, in the news, in the event to, to look at, to, to learn more about the needs of citizens. Also, we work on data government and it's a huge <laughs> work that we're doing right now, municipal data culture. Well, from the data, we need to extract the value. So we need to help our colleague knowing the value of their data. So this is the work that we are doing right now. And of, of course, well, being with you today, explain the, the thought leadership, we want to continue to move forward with the movement. So that's it. I don't know if you have some question. Thank you very much. Oh. We'll have time for one quick question from the audience or from uh, some of the speakers. I have a question for you at the end, so we, we can we can also keep moving as well. So thank you very much, Veronique. Uh, we will be moving now to uh, the city of Hamilton. Just put this up. Give me a second. You know, can everybody see that in full screen mode? Hopefully, yeah, I'm seeing it. All. So, hi, I'm, I'm Cyrus Tranny. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for the City of Hamilton. Uh, really briefly, for those of you that don't know where we're located, uh, we're in southern Ontario, um, just west of Toronto and and north of Buffalo, or, or west of Buffalo, I guess we'd say. Uh, we're, we're a tier one municipality in, in the province, and in, in terms of managing all services, everything from uh, parks, golf courses, um, cemeteries, all the way up to waste water and a, and a whole range of services. Uh, we're about a little over half a million, 10th largest city, um, and obscure little fact, we are also known as the city of waterfalls because through our city, we have an escarpment, uh, uh, geographic feature. I wouldn't call it a mountain, but an escarpment, and we have a whole bunch of rivers and, and creeks that flow over those, and there's over 100 waterfalls in the city. Um, just some metrics around our open data site. Uh, I'll note in 2018, we switched to a new platform where previously we were just listing data sets that you could click on and, and download. So this is kind of where we started our open data journey, and then in 2019, launched a more formal uh, open data platform. Uh, we don't have really metrics related to API views on our data sets uh, that I'm aware of. Our, our metric system allows us to capture like direct downloads uh, as well as views. Um, so you can see like fairly, I would say, you know, for our size of our city, we're, we're definitely not large as some, as some of the other data set providers that are out there from other uh, cities. Um, and we're continuing to, to grow our data sets that are available, but we're also starting to switch away from trying to get away from this idea of you know, volume. This this is the number of data sets that you have uh, useful and move towards, you know, I think somebody on the call, I forget who said it was, you know, data with purpose uh, and using our open data sets to help us tell some some stories. But that gives you an idea of sort of what our, uh, our portal traffic gets. Uh, again, we don't have a dedicated team. There's about five people that are part of a working group and everybody has full-time jobs and they support open data, uh, again, sort of off the side of their desks. 
um, and we meet once a month and we spend a lot of time actually going out and trying to beg cajole and force nicely other operation areas to provide us their their data uh, we recently have developed a draft open data policy so what you're seeing is a screenshot of our we have an online uh, public engagement portal where we posted our open data policy uh, we felt getting feedback uh, from the public around our open data policy uh, kind of aligned to open data policy principles. So it was drafted internally uh, with feedback from various internal stakeholders, our, our legal, our privacy, and we did have some consultation with the um, IPC, um, well, the privacy commissioner here in, in, in Ontario and, and a few others. Uh, some folks on this call have even helped give us some feedback. Um, and we have that up for public input. We're closing that fairly shortly, and then we're going to be trying to finalize that. So we, even though we've had an open data policy open data program we didn't have a formal open data policy it does adopt the sort of main principles of the open data charter uh, where we're trying to go to open by default uh, we have some caveats around that we're recognizing even staff resourcing um, and i think in line with some of the discussions that we already had i think it's that you know there's no way in reality that we're resourced to make every single data element that the city produces open by default um, so it's going to be you know a bit of a blend of open with purpose but open by default but we did feel that open by default was a cultural change that we wanted to instill and had support of our senior leadership team to go with that sort of uh, language uh, because of in the past that we've sort of had a, I think there's sometimes a hesitancy of people understanding what, why they should be sharing their data. We publish, you know, reports that have really good data or historical data in them. Um, I'll give you a couple of really quick examples. You know, there's an annual collision report that has really good historical data. There was a, a collision vision zero collision report uh, dashboard that was really slick put together by our, our transportation operations maintenance group, but you couldn't actually get at the data underneath it. So you had a great report with historical data. You had a great dashboard with data, but you couldn't make it machine readable. So we work with them to kind of bring that data in so and have it integrated and automatically updated. We are working on a very initial project on prioritizing our data quality. So because we still kind of see ourselves as being fairly new, it was more about just getting more and more data sets out there that had we, we felt had some use uh, for public interest. Um, and now we've kind of, this may not be the final, and this is ripped from a bunch of other places uh, as well, uh, but we're trying to create an evaluation criteria that we're then going to retroactively go back and apply to all our data sets on open data with the hopes of um, kind of floating to the top uh, some of those data sets and the metrics around them not as a hey your data is not good go fix it more so you know these are some you know trying to instill that language of literacy around what makes for good data sets uh, again because we're generally going out and, and begging and cajoling people to give us their data and we're hoping that this will kind of build that data literacy piece i'll also add we have sort of some work that's starting on enterprise data management which may fit in but that's being sort of done outside of the open data uh, window and we're also working on an internal um, data repository where people can go to at least find out where data lives in the city and we're going to try to do tight linkage with that back to open data a couple examples around story um, telling and where we're, we're trying to go. So anything you see on this screen, even though it may look like a dashboard or a map, initiated with the need to get an open data set. And then the open data set became the dashboard, or we kind of did them at the same time. So on the top right, we had a lot of uh, demands from folks to ask, you know, our council, uh, the media, even our own internal groups were talking about different things around housing and homelessness. And there was a lot of effort being made to pr produce reports where the data already existed. So we worked with our housing and homelessness teams on it and to come up with, they actually sort of defined what were those data elements that the, the community and council and, and part of their reporting structure looked like. So we, these are all open data sets that then became sort of dashboards. Uh, the bottom left is something that we haven't released yet. It's going to be released shortly, but uh, we actually went and um, 
use uh, did some work with CIRA, the Canadian Internet Registry Association, and MLab, and we pulled uh, some of the speed testing data that exists for the municipality. And as part of an information internet information page, uh, we'll be presenting sort of this this visualization of the evolution of, of speed testing uh, across our forward uh, sortation areas for our region on the broad broadband side and digital equity information sharing. We've also, um, you know, we had a very static view of, of council expenses. It was a really ugly table. We updated our website and there was some requests for additional functionality. So we thought that was a good opportunity. So that's the top right example where we've created a visualization dashboard that ties back in automatically into our uh, accounting solution and pulls certain expense categories. There's some expense categories that are private, but um, through a uh, sort of a transformation process and filtering that's been approved by both finance and some of our governance directives. Uh, we've created an interactive dashboard where citizens can look at both our council expenses uh, and our senior leadership team expenses. And new uh, for 2023, what we used to do is we used to have a whole bunch of service profiles on our website, uh, which really evolved from an internal activity that someone decided at some point that, hey, let's just put all these like we issued like so many dog licenses. We issued so many taxi licenses. Well, we had done some metric analysis on utilization and like the page views on that content were like non-existent. So we said, okay, instead of spending organizational effort to like put together all these numbers that get updated every year that nobody looks at based on usage metrics, let's take around, there was about 900 metrics in this sort of profile base. We made that an open data set. So the historical data was preserved as a static open data set. And we amalgamated that down to about 90 metrics um, that we've released as, a, as part of our city dashboard that cover like census data, some of our services, um, our council priorities, which are still under development. Um, and we launched it as a beta to get feedback. Uh, and again, the thing about the dashboard is any data set that you click on, there is another subsequent link that has a data dictionary that we've included. Um, and we've also included a link to the open data set so people can download the data that makes up the dashboards. Um, and the last example I'll, I'll hone in on is, is, again, trying to find use cases. So for our municipal election that was held, we created about, I think it was 10 different open data sets. So it might have been like ward boundary uh, shape files, um, a whole bunch of things, uh, candidates that were running, incumbent uh, candidates, polling locations, advanced polling locations. Uh, and based on those data sets, uh, we launched sort of a municipal uh, information page, but we also did a pilot around using a virtual assistance through Google and Amazon Alexa that were then going in and, and querying the open data sets uh, to provide some of the answers that were asked. You could ask it like, where can I vote? Uh, and, and based on you having provided your address or the, the solution knowing your address would give you the uh, advanced polling location and your election day polling information. And it was a very time limited use um, example that we put up because it was safe and our elections team had a mandate for enhancing uh, engagement. Um, so it was a neat way of tying in some of the work that we've done on open data to a practical application. Um, and that's it on my end. I'll quickly stop sharing, but I will comment just on um, uh, some of the challenges that we have that everyone sort of alluded to. Again, really getting organizational buy-in to support open data is an ongoing challenge. Uh, we get a lot of questions of, well, why should we share it? And hopefully through the policy, we've also done something new. We got approval from our senior leadership team to create open data champions. So these are people that have uh, basically do not need to have any experience in open data. We did try to identify people that were maybe worked with data across our different divisions. We have five divisions. And what we do with them is we just share information with them with the intent that they will then float it up to their direct leadership team. So we celebrate, you know, new data sets and we share that with the group. Um, if there's newspaper articles or news articles or things or events, like this event would have been shared uh, with the group um, as well. I'm not seeing anybody else on. So so it's kind of hit or miss from Hamilton, but just trying to instill that culture. We don't. We do have some data leads within the organization that we we tap on, and I'll also mention a lot of our data sets are still manually updated uh, on an annual basis, not directly integrated. We're trying to move to a more directly integrated where we can pull the data set. So uh, a lot of work, but that's sort of a snapshot of what's sort of been transpiring uh, in Hamilton over the past you know 12 to 18 months. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Cyrus. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience or from the speakers?
Uh, I have, I have a just a just a quick question around um, the the visualization of data you you showed, for example, of a, on on broadband. Um, people want um, maybe want sometimes very specific um, views of or understandings of what's happening in my area, what's happening in happening in my city, and um, in a in a city like Hamilton. I'm wondering how much how much of that are you, uh, do you have to tailor that to uh, the uh, distribution of people within the city? Uh, I, I noticed you were using forward sortation areas, for example, and some of those can be quite can cover quite large areas or quite small areas. Um, uh, how how do you try to try to meet the needs of, of different folks uh, across the city? Yeah, I'm not sure we have a get, we've gotten it right. There are some data sets that we will publish on a ward level basis, uh, and we have not shown. Uh, we do have what are called ward profiles that our counselors use. But to your question, I don't think we we know the magic answer to that. What we'll, we'll, depends on the data. Uh, our thought process currently is more like, hey, if we can make it available and people can go in and slice it and dice it on their own if they have different needs you'll never kind of meet the hey we've mastered a, a, a visualization that meets the needs of everybody's needs uh, for how they want to see it um so yeah it's kind of like trial by trial by error and, and feedback and we may not get it right or we might get mostly there i'll give you one example is you know one of the, the most successful open data sets and visualizations we've ever done was our covid um COVID by census tract. So in, in the heat of the sort of the pandemic, we were publishing on a daily basis um, when there was large scale testing uh, cases by uh, forward sortation area. And that was being scanned by a bunch of APIs and other things like that. And, and general like media and, and public, the number of, we were over a million hits just on that one visualization and and data set and and now that there isn't testing it's sort of dropped off and no one's even really looking at it even though we continue to update the data with the minimal sets we have um so i'm not sure i'm answering your question but we don't know if we're getting it right uh and we do our best uh, and hope that hey if it's not working go into the underlying data and you know on occasion people will make a request just to our open data portal for something we'll see if we can facilitate it um, but again there's no magic sauce it's more trial and error Thank you. Um, any any more questions from the audience? We will have time uh, at the end as well for for more questions. Our final uh, speaker. Sorry. Oh, please. Just a quick question. Um, you talk about that program for open data around homelessness. It's an ongoing pen. Uh, never mind. Not right. It's an ongoing problem that many cities across Canada and I suspect across North America, Seattle especially too, are facing. And I, I think I'd love to see more of that. But it's such a sensitive issue that trying to even approach it or trying to ask for that sort of data to be made public carries a bunch of issues, right? And so I'm curious what the what the uh, impact has been, and maybe some of the follow or issues that you you've kind of come across on that particular data set. Thank you. Yeah, I think you know for us and the the team that put it together, uh, a lot of it was just making sure you know obviously from a privacy perspective and and things like that. We we do our due diligence. Um, I don't have an answer for you in terms of how it's being utilized or adopted or helping necessarily drive a change in in homelessness. I, I think part of it was getting visibility and making a one-stop location where community partners that were using some of that data or were interested in that data could just go and get it themselves. Part of it was around transparency of, you know, we were using different reports with different metrics sometimes, and it allowed internally folks to start to talk and make sure they were referencing some of the, the same common data elements uh, when they were speaking around homelessness. Has the creation of the dashboard actually helped to maybe move the needle around reducing housing and, and homelessness issues in the city? I would probably openly say it probably hasn't, but it's helped on the conversations. And it's also, you know, selfishly, maybe reduced a bit of workload internally where, you know, for media requests, staff aren't going to have to 
provide individual data sets for media-based requests and can and point folks to the to the dashboard. So, you know, great question, but uh, I think uh, for us, it's more about getting funding in order to be able to drive the programs to help with homelessness, and hopefully the results will then show in the long-term data trends that will be visible in, in the dashboard uh, it, itself as we try to move the needle on that. Thank you for the question, Eugene. And just to very briefly, just to build on that, I think this is one of those key uh, uh, issue areas where it's an opportunity to also dive into where data is being collected, who is collecting that that type of data. Um, homelessness is not only a, an issue that is addressed by uh, governments, right? We have civil society partners, NGOs also working on the issue and collecting data. And there's a whole, there's, there's an infrastructure around that, which this this could be a whole other conversation to, to unpack. Um, but thank you very much. We will be moving to our last um, speaker, uh, OpenAQ, Chris. Hi, uh, I'm, you might be muted. everybody. Sorry that I was, <laughs> can you see my screen? All right, quick stretch. I'm your last presenter and a little bit different. What we are is a global aggregator of a specific set of data. Um, we basically provide open, free, universal access to air quality data. We're a tiny team of four. We're located in the United States, nonprofit. Um, and now I'm having trouble actually moving my, there we go. All right. So we harmonize aggregate, well, we at, we're aggregating disparate data from governments and other producers of air quality data all across the globe. We're bringing it onto a universal platform that we are also harmonizing that data so that it's easier to work with. And like, like all of you, what we, we believe in is that that open data will allow utilization from all parts of society. It's used a lot by scientists and other researchers to, to evaluate the data. Uh, it's used by journalists and communicators to tell the story of the terrible air quality there is all across the world. And it's used by decision makers or people who are trying to influence decision makers. This is a map of, of, of where we are collecting data across the globe. As you can see, <laughs> we're mainly getting data from the more affluent countries in the world. Our goal is to really increase the amount of data that, that we can find and put on our platform from low and middle income countries. That said, we did an analysis last year. We looked all across the world and we found that about 61% of countries in the world are actually monitoring air quality in some way. About 53% of countries across the world are sharing their air quality data in some way. However, when you look at how that data is shared, we ran it through a set of criteria um, and only about a quarter of countries worldwide are sharing it in a way that it can fully maximize the use. I mean, getting to that concept of, of, of programmatic access, uh, machine to machine, which really is what is needed to, to open it up to everybody. So we've got a way to go. <laughs> and these challenges kind of reflect back on what some of you were saying earlier. We know that there are, if, if you think that that, fo that governments in, um, well, indeed, governments in United States, Canada, North America tend to have more resources to share data, but still, it's, it's pro you don't have enough budget even in your budget. So we know, number one, some governments can't even afford to monitor air quality. Others are challenged to share that data or share that data in a full way because of these funding constraints. 
Some don't even know that there's a, a global platform out there that they could share on. And then maybe this is this is one of the uh, more serious issues. There's reluctance to share. Uh, consider, let's say you're a country with terrible air quality. Maybe you don't actually want your citizens to, to, to know that it's as bad as it is. We certainly run into that problem. We, so we are aggregating data not only from governments, uh, but also there are um, uh, so people have what are like purple air monitors. Some of you might have heard of those. Any individual who has a purple air monitor, that's open by default. We aggregate that onto our platform. Uh, lots of researchers, university analysts might have a project that they're putting air sensors out there. Community groups are, are also doing this. And, and when it is open and when we can find it, we aggregate it onto our platform. So one specific, uh, uh, trying to pull it back to here in the United States, um, there are a number, this is so fantastic, a number of environmental justice groups are starting to do their own air quality monitoring in their communities. And uh, we could be sharing that data on our data platform. Instead of each project building its own data platform, they could actually just put the data on ours and then create a geographical boundary of the data that they want to look at. And the data then would not only include their own air, air sensors, but any other air sensors and monitors that are open in that area would reduce duplication of effort, enable more peer-to-peer -peer learning. And then by having this data open, it enables analyses on a, on a, on a macro level. A researcher could be looking at a bunch of communities across the country and beyond and looking at what the disparities are. However, what we have found, like for example, the US EPA is a funder of a lot of these projects and they, they're not necessarily prioritizing that that data could or should be open, or they're not necessarily doing a lot of overarching coordination that would, that would reduce duplication of effort. So that's just a, one challenge I wanted to throw out there from our end here in the United States. Um, we are very optimistic about the future. We have found that some companies that produce air sensors and work with specific projects are starting to come knock at our door to say, we'd like to share our data. It, it, sometimes it's their ethos. Like there's a company called Air Gradient in Thailand that is like all about the greatest openness possible. Um, and then sometimes it's their customers who are coming to them and saying, we want this data to be open. And an example is a company in um, Croatia that recently came and knocked on our door and said, well, uh, there's, a, there's a health, government health agency in Zagreb that they really believe in open data. They are our customer. We looked around, we found your data platform and, and we'd like our, you, this is fantastic, could we share? I guess my other optimism is that the whole concept of open data has been, as you've all described, been growing over the years. And I think that together we can really raise awareness of the positive impacts and, and make it the norm, not the exception. I'll close there and um, welcome any questions and excited about the next part of the chat here. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Wilfrida, do you have a question? I do. Thank you, Chris, for that great presentation. I'm always impressed by OpenAQ because you've essentially been successful in taking the data commons model and applying it to air quality. Do you think that that model could be scaled to other global crises? Uh, topics like humanitarian crises or gender equality or social justice? And if if not, what, what have been barriers to doing that? I, I, I certainly think that can happen wherever there are these types of data sets that can be found, right? You have to find the open data. <laughs> and you also have to, incur, I mean, part of what we do is we evangelize, um, try to encourage openness of data. Uh, and it's hard, I'll have to say it's hard to do on a global scale. <laughs> so, um, but that's that's very interesting that you had mentioned, like we've been talking with folks at, uh, at I can't even remember the name of the organization, but they look at humanitarian data and um, they're, 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 they're again worldwide and trying to do this. I think they're, I mean, I think it's very possible, but then 
you know, starting new organization, who should do it is kind of the question. And I will say back when we were founded, we were founded by an atmospheric scientist whose husband happened to be a data expert. They looked around, they didn't necessarily want to do this. They wanted a government, you know, somebody else, and they wanted some university or something to try to do this. But, but the no, no local, no national government is necessarily going to do it because it's just they're interested in their own nation, not the entire world, right? And so you you have to. So we ultimately found kind of only really a nonprofit could do this. Um, so that might be the case with some of this other these other important societal issues behind which data could be useful. It may be that a nonprofit needs to do it. Thank you. Uh, if I may just jump in and, and just build on this. Um, so air quality is, it's one of those issues that is very visible to people. Uh, and certainly in Thailand, it's visible to such an extent that it's, it's, a, it's an issue, it's an, basically a national issue for, for everybody. Um, and that can serve as a very strong driver for uh, the need for uh, more data collection and more publication of data. Uh, but what about places where that that um, environmental issue isn't present or, uh, or maybe not present to sufficient uh, degrees to, um, to stimulate uh, maybe uh, nonprofits or civil society as well to take up the issue and, and raise the banner? Um, what happens then? Um, I think one of my I think one of the challenging things for environment might be that uh, working on demand alone may not be enough because by the time you you start to have the demand, you have the problem and you you haven't prevented the problem, right? Well, um, I guess firstly, I would say that uh, ninety nine percent nine, of us in the world are breathing polluted air. And so it is pretty. It's it's everywhere and, and it's true. Some places far far worse than others. Some, some people far more vulnerable. Um, and in I think, but when I when you go back to that initial uh, chart I showed that only sixty one percent of governments are actually monitoring. You're quite right. Why are those other governments not monitoring? It either has not again they're not they don't have the resources or it has not become as visible and there's not a, as great of a push for it. We don't have the resources to necessarily push governments to even, I mean, that, that's the first step. There has to be the monitoring. We're more at the side of, of, of pushing for the open data when the monitoring begins. But there, this is a huge issue that um, is, and it fits tightly in with climate change. And so I think there, there is starting to be more and more attention, especially as we see that climate change is driving forest fires um, and, and, and increased smog incidents and so on and so forth. So I think that they go tightly together. So there's more attention to climate change. There's also more attention to air quality. Yuri? Yeah, thanks, Chris. That was a great presentation. A uh, couple of things that I have personal interest in, and, and I had had a discussion with uh, an Israeli company called Rizometer, I think probably about 10 years ago or so. But looking at the, and you may have mentioned an application that allows for uh, citizen data collection around uh, air quality. and the other question that I had is related to the duplication of efforts uh, and whether something like this that you have on a global basis, why wouldn't something like that the, uh, be supported as a UN data project? So two different questions, but interested in your, uh, in your feedback. Well, um... I didn't really talk much about the private companies that are out there because you all are really in the government space. But um, some private companies that produce these in this instrumentation to measure air quality, um, and then and then they either they're selling those to individuals or they're working with projects, right? Some of them are not at all interested in sharing their data. They actually they're making profit off of their data, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> some are again open by the purple arrows open by default. Uh, so I'm I'm not quite sure what your question was there, but I will say that we run into that those types of issues as well. And um, the duplication of effort, we think we could be potentially helpful to to governments as well. Um, an example is uh, Denver. We just did a MOU with them where they're pretty happy to sh share their data onto our platform so that when when individuals might have troubles downloading it, they can actually turn to OpenAQ and ask how to download. And, and so that the city of Denver doesn't have to actually deal with, you know, they, they can kind of pass that little piece along. Um, so there's really a lot of opportunities to actually, instead of everybody having their own data platform, put it on a single da data platform and it reduces <laughs> servers and so on and so forth, which is a good thing. And I mean, there's just a lot of opportunity out there and, and we can only respond to whole much, so much because we're a tiny team. I know your other question was, shouldn't someone like United Nations do this? That would be a great idea. <laughs> there's a United Nations environmental program Nobody has taken. Nobody has taken it up. Thank you. Uh, first, we have a question from John. Uh, John Glasgow, uh, would you like to um, uh, open the mic to ask your question? Well, I can. I can also read it for you. Uh, John has a question on uh, data use usability. Um, so university research indicates that open data has not fulfilled its promise in terms of being usable for innovation. Does any anyone have any data, open or otherwise, on how startup firms and other innovators use open data to create new products and services? And also what problems do they encounter in terms of data usability? Anyone here on, who has looked at data and how startups use open data. Yeah, I can I can provide two ex specific examples in Canada that we're aware of. Um, there's one company called Fish Boy. It's a fish app that uses atmospheric conditions within the app to tell fishermen um, what the optimized conditions are for fishing so they can maximize their catch. And they leverage environmental data from um, Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as other departments to be able to feed into that app. And they're in touch with us just to make sure that that data stays current, it stays up to date, so that it can feed in through automation into their end product. And if Environment Canada, for example, makes any changes without, without the heads up to that organization, it directly affects their bottom line. And so they've been in touch with us to let us know that that's that that has actually happened. And then we work with them to resolve the problem to make sure that the data stays current. Another example is a startup called Nowise. They use real estate data to provide projections on the market that people then use to make decisions about where is best to live in Canada, where they can buy properties and so on. And Nowise is interested in our Canadian housing survey data, which is not yet made available to the public, but they came in touch with us to, to find out if they could get the data through a data sharing agreement, for example, so that that feeds directly into their product that's used for innovation as well. So those are just two, two slight examples. And then the other part of your questions in terms of what the problems are for data usability, I think the challenge that they're finding is the ability to aggregate the data. So a lot of times they'll find the information in the public sphere, but it's not aggregated and consumable in a way that can be easily integrated for innovation. So our challenge is to be able to provide that data in an aggregated form. Thank you. Uh, John, I would also say a part of what we've seen today is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of what we know about the impacts of open data have to be quite anecdotal in nature. Uh, and uh, some, of this, some of the answers to this might be to really hone in on a specific uh, um, domain or uh, a market segment. Uh, and then um, and have more investigation there as well. Um, we have another uh, question from uh, Open North. Thanks. Um, yeah, so going back, uh, this is a question for Chris, because I had talked to municipalities who are familiar with Purple Air um, and we're dealing with some of these issues around uh, air quality. 
I think one of the challenges they raised, and again, this is outside of my scope of knowledge, but um, was just in terms of like standardization of data and that, you know, while Purple Hour was very accurate and very useful, like getting the municipality to be able to use that was a real struggle because of the different methodology. Um, again, I don't, I can't speak to the details of that, but I don't know, just question if that's something that is a challenge with getting different governments to use and interact with this data. Um, obviously that, you know, it's a, a common theme throughout open data, I guess, but yeah. Well, a couple of things, someone mentioned D GTFS at some point, and there is no standardization of error, you know, there is no standardization of air quality instrument of monitoring instrumentation. That'd be a great thing, huge task, okay? <laughs> Um, but we do, when we pull data onto our platform, I mentioned that we harmonize wherever we can. That could be dates, formats, it could be parameters of how people actually use different parameters to measure each pollutant. So we do as much harmonization, harmonization as possible to, to make it easier to use on the other side. And in fact, scientists, that's why they use our platform. Well, not only because they don't have to then go and find every little piece of data everywhere, but because it's been standardized, we've done that hard work so that they don't have to do it. So again, we're reducing duplication of effort. Uh, and purple air, I will say, air sensors are a variety of, of they're varying in how accurate they are, they are, but most of them are, they're not as good as a government grade reference grade monitor, but they, they tend to be close enough that they're useful for analysis and they can raise awareness. Thank you, Cyrus. Yeah, Chris, just a follow-up question. Are you guys polling like through API existing data sources or are people giving you a direct feed of their data sources or like how does the data get into it or is it a mix of kind of all of the above? Mostly API, that's certainly the best. So we're linking into others into API, via API. Sometimes we scrape data as well. Um, so, and that's the hardest if a government, when I said that there are different levels of openness, if, if, if there's some air quality data that's on a PDF buried deep in a government website that's open, but it's much harder to get, but we are able to do some scraping. Thank you. Veronique? It's great. Uh, open AQ, I didn't know about it, and I, it's great, and I see Montreal is in it. So. But my question is, as I mentioned before, it's hard for us to, uh, to, to know what is the use of our data. And when I see Montreal on your map, I have just the same question of, uh, as serious. Is it this, the data of Montreal or not that you're using? And it's not written. So uh, do, can you confirm the source or is there a place where we can see the source of the da data? This yes, is often the, the problem that we have, you know, people don't mention the source, so we don't know if it's our open data. Yeah, it's, we have the, the metadata that, that says exactly what the station is and who owns that data. Um, and that gets, I think, to an overarching question earlier, I guess, that or someone that folks had mentioned earlier, who ultimately uses this data? And I will say that in our we we already know that it's mainly used by scientists and other types of researchers, but we're going to need to have what's called an API key to to really understand, and that kind of slows things down. But we're going to need to have people actually sh sign on to use our data so we understand better who uses it. Um, but that's a block. That's a bit of a blocker, right? And I'm sure that you 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 run into that as well. Uh, Eugene? This is a general question for everyone, and I apologize if this seems like a stupid question here, but I, I've heard this so often by different providers of open data, and I use open data a lot. I, I, I create a number of tools that use open data, and it strikes me as weird that um, I realize that open should mean completely open, but could there not just be a bit of a license that suggests that the use of this should um, be reported somehow, or you know, you should get back to the source and let 
the source know that this is being used by certain organizations in some way or somehow have a way to track that information back because it seems, I suppose there are negative outcomes to this approach, but I'm just curious about the general thoughts of the people here. Thanks. So, so you're posing, so this is a, this sounds a bit like a, uh, a bit like a cultural challenge as well. How, how, do, how do we instill, how do we make sure that people who use data also feel that they have maybe some, some kind of responsibility back to the people who provide the data? Is, is that yeah. what you're saying? Kind of, I'm actually taking it a step further and saying that any organization or really persons that end up using something that is created by somebody else. Um, I mean, when you talk about open source code, you have to cite, you have to keep <laughs> the information of the person who originally created that code anyway, right? And so why does that not exist? And why is that not true for the use of open data? Any, any uh, thoughts from anybody here? Well, maybe we have to rethink uh on the license we are using you know common creative i let people use the the data for any purpose and right now uh we are looking for a new way to <laughs> reinvent this uh th this uh, license because you know some purples are not good like there is most of the person that use the data or a nice person that want to bring new services, but we know that with AI, it may be not a good purpose, and but we don't have the tools to manage it. So maybe it's something that we should do together to rethink of a new license, which could let people completely use our data, but maybe with something back just to let us know uh, and help us to put more data. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have time for Melanie, 30 seconds, and then Yuri, also 30 seconds. Melanie? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, yeah, we have the same problem. Like, people use our data all the time, and we don't necessarily know, and then you'll ask, you'll be asked, well, who's using it? And you have no idea, because it's just open data, right? Like, it's, and then if we change something, we don't know whether we're breaking somebody's whatever it is that they've decided to build on it or not. Like there's just, there's just no accountability, like you said, back to us. And I mean, yeah, you do want the data to be open and we're all about open data, but you know, it's not really, um, it's pretty hard to report on what you don't know. You only know how many times people have downloaded it. Yuri? Yeah, I, I agree uh, what's been said and I would, I would say we've been on this track for a long time and having difficulty in reporting on uh, the value proposition of, of open data. So I, I do think we need to revisit the, uh, the uh, open data license that is being used, uh, you know, considering things like Creative Commons, et cetera, to, uh, to get some feedback so we can build on the business case and actually help uh, prioritize the, the open data services that we're providing. I think it's time to, uh, to reconsider the current, uh, the current open data license. Okay, thank you. We are, we are running a little over time, but thank you all for your patience.